Okay, neural networks are computer models intended to reflect the organization of human brains and are often used, and are often used in studies of brain function. According to analysis of 11,000 such networks, Ryan Schaefer and colleagues caution when drawing conclusions about brains from observations of a neural network. So they're designed to mimic human brains, but they advise caution when drawing conclusions about brains from the networks. They found that when attempting to mimic grid cells, brain cells used navigation, while 90% of the networks could accomplish navigation tasks, only about 10% of those exhibited any behaviors similar to those of grid cells. So whatever they're doing, the neural networks are navigating, but in a very different way than say human grid cells. Okay, here's our claim we need to support, but even this approximation of grid cell activity has less to do with similarity between the neural networks and biological brains than it does with the rules programmed into the networks. Okay, so the rules programmed are causing the neural networks to do what they do, which is very different than the grid cells in the biological brain. So that's what I'm going to look for in my answer. So the rules that allow for neural networks to exhibit behaviors like those of grid cells have no equivalent in the function of biological brains. The rules that allow for neural networks to exhibit behaviors, so that is to do navigation, that could well be, let's say, let's keep going. The networks that do not exhibit behaviors like those of grid cells, which is none of them apparently, were nonetheless programmed with rules that had proven useful. No, it's not whether they're useful or not. Okay, not popular, not successful or useful. That's not the key here. C, neural networks can often accomplish tasks that biological brains do, okay, navigation, but they are typically programmed with rules to model multiple types of brain cells simultaneously. Okay, they are typically, so that looks good. They do the tasks. They're programmed with rules to model. Model multiple types of brain cells. Is the rules programmed to model the types of brain cells? No, the rules are programmed to accomplish the tasks. I don't think that's correct, okay? Sounded interesting at first. D, once a neural network is programmed, it is trained on certain tasks to see if it can independently arrive at processes that are similar to those performed by biological brains that are so no the processes are not similar it's very different in this case right so i think the correct answer here is the rules that allow for networks to exhibit behaviors like those of grid cells navigation have no equivalent in the function of biological biological brains yeah those rules are not like the grid cells a is going to be your answer okay this one this is a strengthening argument command of evidence we want a quote that illustrates or supports the claim. Let's take a look. O Pioneers, 1913 novel by Willa Cather. In the novel, Cather depicts Alan Bergeson as a person who takes comfort in understanding the world around her. So our quote has to show she understands the world around her. She's not confused by it. She's not mystified by it. She's probably confidently knowing the world around her. So let's see what the different quotes are a she looked fixedly up the bleak street as if she were gathering her strength to face something as if she were trying with all her might to grasp okay she's trying to grasp here therefore she doesn't know so that means she doesn't know the world she's not understanding it all that's wrong okay b she had never known before <laughs> she had never known before she can't possibly understand the world around her okay Unless it says she somehow does now understand. And no, that doesn't seem to be the case, okay? C, Alexandra drove off alone. The rattle of her wagon was lost in the howling of the wind, but her lantern held firmly between her feet, made a moving point of light along the highway, going deeper and deeper into the, that says nothing about knowing or not knowing the world around her, okay? D, Alexandra drew her shawl closer about her and stood leaning against the frame of the mill, Looking at the stars, which glitter so keenly through the frosty autumn air, she loved to watch them. She could think of their vastness and distance and her and of their ordered march. So she kind of knew what they're doing. It fortified her to reflect on. So she strengthened herself by reflecting upon the great operations of nature. And when she thought of the law that lay behind them, she felt a sense of personal security. So she felt this comfort and security, knowing and seeing the laws of nature in front of her, that shows she understands the world. D is going to be our answer. 
Okay, we need a quote that's going to support so the strength and weakens command of evidence supports the assertion of historians. So let's see what that is. Uh, in 1534, King Henry VIII of England split with the Catholic Church and declared himself head of the Church of England, in part because Pope Clement VII refused to annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon, whose head I think he later cut off, if I recall. Two years later, Henry VIII introduced a policy titled the dissolution of the monasteries that by 1540 resulted in the closure of all Catholic monasteries in England and the confiscation of their estates. So he closed all the Catholic churches, basically, and stole their money. Nice. Some historians assert that the enactment of the policy was primarily motivated by perceived financial opportunities. Okay, so interesting. They're going to be perceived financial opportunities. In other words, we're not going to see evidence that he stole the money and ran away with it after the fact. We're going to see, we should look for an answer to this evidence. He's, there's something to steal and take advantage of. Clearly, he did not do this to uh, defend the love of his life, whose head he later chopped off. That's not his motivation. So let's see which, which answer choice matches. A, at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries, about 2% of the adult male population of England were monks by night. 1690, the proportion of the male... What? Okay, that says nothing about a financial or perceived financial opportunity. B, a contemporary description of the dissolution of the monasteries. So there was houses, recounts with this testimony that monks were allowed to keep the contents of their cells in the monastery. No, that, again, nothing about a financial opportunity for Henry VIII there. In 1535, the year before enacting the dissolution of the monasteries, Henry commissioned a survey of the value of the church holdings in England. Okay, this is going to be it. He commissioned a survey of the holdings of the church. The work performed by sheriffs, bishops, and magistrates began that January and was completed by the summer. So before he actually went and took the money, he wanted to know, how much am I going to get, right? That shows that he was financially motivated. That is going to be our answer. C. Let's just check D. The October 1536 revolt, known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, had several economic motives. High food prices due to a poor harvest. The So, okay, I don't know what this is. This is not what he did, and it might have had economic motives, but that's not what Henry VIII did. This is, you know, irrelevant to our answer. C is the answer. Okay, this is a if true and support Tannen's hypothesis. Strength and weakening, command of evidence. Let's see what his hypothesis is. Linguist, her hypothesis, Deborah Tannen, has cautioned against framing contentious issues in terms of two highly competitive perspectives, such as pro versus con. According to Tannen, this debate-driven approach can strip issues of their complexity, and when used in front of an audience, can be less informative, that's going to be key to us, less informative than the presentation of multiple perspectives in a non-competitive format. So that would be not debate, basically just like um, some kind of informative, multiple perspectives, not debating each other. To test Hy Tannen's hypothesis, students conducted a study in which they showed participants in one of three different versions of local news. Each version featured a debate between two commentators with opposing views, so that's our competitive format, two, pro versus con, a panel of three commentators with various views, that's our non-competitive case there with multiple perspectives or a single commentator. I'm not sure how that's going to fit in there. So I'm looking for an answer that will show the audience got more out of the panel of three commentators with various views than they did from the debate pro versus con to commentator debate. A, on average, participants perceived commentators as in the debate as more knowledgeable about the issue than commentators in the panel. No, that would be against what we would expect from Tannen's hypothesis. B, on average, participants perceived commentators in the panel as more knowledgeable. Yes, that would be good about the issue than the single commentator. I don't know. Hold off on that one. I'm not sure what the single commentator says exactly about this. C, on average, participants who watched the panel correctly answered more questions. So actually, they're not, this is not their perception, but they actually 
answered correctly more questions who watched the panel than those who watched the debate between the two. So we can judge informative by actually how well they answer questions, information. This, this is probably better than just simply, uh, you know, how do you perceive type survey. C is going to be our answer. That's solid evidence. D, on average, participants who watch a single commentator correctly answer more questions about the issue than who watch the debate. Okay, that says nothing about the claim that Tannen made. C is going to be our best answer. 